Her red-headed character, FBI agent Dana Scully, was adored by millions. The role brought her fame, an army of devoted fans, and Emmy and Golden Globe Awards. Gillian Anderson is a versatile actress, star of the theater scene, author of books, and an active public figure. This woman combines a lot. Despite this, in her personal life, she's still in search of the one and only. How does the TV star of the 90s live now? What was she arrested for as a teenager? How did the loss of a loved one affect her future life? Why does the star easily change her accent? And did Duchovny and Anderson actually have an affair? You will learn about this and even more today on the Biographer Channel. Get comfortable, and we are starting. Gillian Leigh Anderson was born in Chicago, Illinois. Her mother, Rosemary Alice, was a computer analyst. Father, Homer Edward Anderson III, was engaged in film production. Shortly after her birth, her parents moved from the United States to Puerto Rico for 15 months and later to England. Edward studied film production at the London School of Film Technique in Covent Garden. Therefore, the girl spent the next nine years of her childhood in the north of London in Crouch End, where she went to Coleridge Primary School. She was the eldest of three children in the Anderson family. Besides Gillian, Rosemary and Homer raised a son, Aaron, and a daughter, Zoe, 14 years younger than her sister. Even as a child, Gillian showed a flair for drama, but was more of a tomboy who dreamt of becoming a marine biologist rather than a movie star. Somehow, I have no idea how the transition was made from wanting to be an archaeologist or a marine biologist to wanting to be an actress, but it just kind of happened. When Anderson was 11 years old, her family returned to the United States and settled in Grand Rapids, Michigan. At the same time, they did not give up their apartment in London and spent their summers there. Anderson later said she had always intended to return to England. I've been asked whether I feel more like a Brit than an American, and I don't know what the answer to that question is. I know that I feel that London is home, and I'm very happy with that as my home. I love London as a city, and I feel very comfortable there. In Grand Rapids, she graduated from Fountain Elementary School, and her teenage years were spent at City High Middle School for gifted students with a strong emphasis on the humanities. Of course, growing up in England and then returning to the U.S. was not easy. Her mother, Rosemary, mentioned that the contrast was just incredible. Plus, Gillian missed all the friends she had grown up with in London, and her classmates all thought she talked funny because she didn't have an American accent. Gillian had to learn to speak like an American for the first time in her life, just to fit in. That's why Anderson now speaks bilingually and is comfortable switching between American and British accents. However, she was bullied at school for her accent and background, so she didn't feel like she belonged in the American environment. This is what prompted the girl to adopt a Midwestern accent. When I was a girl, I wanted to be a grown-up. I had a goldfish named Ajax. What happened to Ajax? I think I won him at a, um, at a fair, at one of those uh, school-like carnivals or something. You carry him home in a plastic bag. I went through, you know, everything acne's pimple you know pimples everything and um awkwardness and nervousness around boys and and feeling completely dorky and goofy and alone and misunderstood and everything ridicule and rejection by classmates could not help but affect the character of the future star so it's not surprising that it was after moving to Grand Rapids that Anderson became a true rebel. Later, the star admitted that she was angry during that period, and it was her way of keeping people at a distance. The woman recalled that at that time, she existed in her own little world and was often sent to the director's office for not being able to keep her mouth shut when needed. The girl's romantic relationships were also far from ordinary. In an interview in 2012, Anderson said, I was in a relationship with a girl for a long time when I was in high school, and then I was in a relationship with a punk rock drug addict. You know, I'm old enough that I can talk about that. Jillian had a real punk appearance. She dyed her hair different colors, shaved her temples, wore a nose piercing, and switched to an all-black wardrobe. Her favorite bands at that time were Dead Kennedys and Skinny Puppy. And what were your favorite bands at school? Share with us in the comments. We would like to know how many punk fans are watching us. Among her classmates, Gillian gained a reputation as the class clown, the weirdest girl, and the one most likely to get arrested. There have been times when I have felt incredibly alone and that I'm the only person in the world who could be feeling that bad or that anxious or that afraid or um, 
and some of the um, the thoughts and manifestations of it, the physical manifestations of panic attacks have been very scary. In an interview with TV Guide, the star admitted that she once taped the locks on all of the lockers, and then she was even arrested during prom for breaking in her school. Such behavior could not but cause inappropriate reaction, so the girl was prescribed therapy sessions. Jillian's life began to change for the better when she decided to audition for the school play. Her mother recalled that her daughter showed a real interest for drama from an early age, and it was always her personality. But Rosemary was finally convinced of her daughter's talent when she was 14 years old, and the teacher let her play the scene on the balcony in Romeo and Juliet. Jillian had no background in Shakespeare, acting, or anything remotely like it. Nobody on either side of our family had any experience with acting, but she studied that scene and mastered it with no effort whatsoever. When she performed it for me, my jaw just dropped. Since then, the girl's life has changed. Her grades have improved, and she has been recognized by her peers and teachers at school as she has shown significant growth and progress in her academic performance, behavior, and attitude. Anderson began to actively participate in her school's productions and later in community theater. She was also a student intern at the Grand Rapids Civic Theater and School of Theater Arts. After graduating from high school in 1986, Jillian studied acting at the theater school at DePaul University in Chicago, where she earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts. The summer after her freshman year, Jillian was selected to participate in the National Theater's three-week summer program at Cornell University. To support herself financially during her student years, she worked at the Goose Island Brew Pub in Chicago. After Anderson became famous, the brewery named one of their beers after her, a Belgian-style farmhouse ale called Jillian. Anderson moved to New York when she was 22 years old. She found an apartment in Greenwich Village, went to auditions, had a relationship with a girl, and worked as a waitress at Dojo, a Japanese health food restaurant in St. Mark's Square. She earned little, and the money was barely enough to cover the rent. Her first acting job, in fact, was a commercial for a dermatology clinic. Kathy wasn't too popular with her co-workers. They thought she'd rather work than go out with the gang. Kathy had acne. She was self-conscious, withdrawn, and believed no one could see past her ugly blemishes. Then her doctor recommended she visit the advanced dermatology centers. Today, Kathy's a new person, still working hard, but now she has a new life, and she's doing great things with it. Six months after moving to the Big Apple, Jillian got a chance to show herself on the stage of the Manhattan Theater Club. Her agent sent the young actress to audition for Alan Eichhorn's production of Absent Friends. The girl auditioned for the role of Evelyn, a gloomy young mother in a black comedy about a group of friends who comfort their friend Colin after the death of his fiance. Director Lynn Meadow was impressed by Anderson's performance, but did not immediately agree to give her that part. She wanted to make sure it wasn't an accident. I didn't realize we would find someone quite this green, but it is one of those great stories where someone is cast purely on ability. Jillian's background is improvisational, and she took those instincts and put them into the highly technical style Alan Eckborn writes in. So, only after the second attempt, the actress was finally approved for participation in the play. This was her first work in the theater. For this role in 1991, the future star received the Theater World Award. Her next theater work was Christopher Hampton's play The Philanthropist at the Long Wharf Theater in New Haven, Connecticut. Also, Jillian made her debut in a low-budget film called The Turning, which was an adaptation of Chris Sarasso's play Home Fires Burning. The actress, together with her partner on the set, starred in an intimate scene which she later regretted very much. After becoming famous, the actress hired lawyers to stop the DVD sale, but this attempt was not successful. In 1992, Anderson decided to move to Los Angeles to pursue a film career. First of all, I swore I'd never move to Los Angeles, and once I did, I swore I'd never do television. It was only after being out of work for almost a year that I began going in to auditions on some stuff that I would pray that I wouldn't get because I didn't want to be involved in it. She broke into television in 1993, acting in the college drama Class of 96 on the new Fox network. She appeared there only in the eighth episode called The Accused, but thanks to this performance, the young actress was noticed. She was sent the script of The X-Files and invited to audition. The idea for the series came to the mind of producer Chris Carter after he read a real report by Harvard professor John Mack about the abduction of people by aliens. The document stated that 3.7 million Americans believe they have been abducted by extraterrestrial civilizations. After some time, 
Carter brought this idea to the Fox Channel, and after a little negotiation, The X-Files was given the green light. The series revolved around FBI agents Fox Mulder, the character of David Duchovny, and Dana Scully, played by Gillian Anderson, who investigated unsolved cases related to paranormal phenomena. It was considered that women tended to believe in the supernatural while men trusted only facts and logic. Screenwriters went against stereotypes. Mulder here was an avid supporter of the supernatural and a conspiracy theorist who believed in the existence of paranormal phenomena, while Scully was a doctor and skeptic, tasked to scientifically analyze her partner's findings. It is interesting that, in life, actors have diametrically opposite views than their screen characters. In 1994, in an interview with Entertainment Weekly, Gillian admitted that she thought it quite likely that there were other planets inhabited by living organisms somewhere in the universe. On the contrary, in one of the television programs, Duchovny talked about how, at the dawn of his popularity, he answered letters from people who allegedly survived abductions by aliens. He felt sorry for them, because in his opinion, the poor people were out of their minds. Do you believe in supernatural and alien creatures? Share your thoughts with us in the comments. We read them all. So how did our future star get on the show? Jillian was 24 when she decided to audition for the role of Dana Scully. Chris Carter immediately wanted to hire Anderson, but the producers demanded to choose a girl with a brighter and more model-like appearance to attract the audience and increase interest in the TV show. Chris did not want the main character of the series to be a brainless blonde whom Mulder would have to fall in love with and saw her as a serious, moderately attractive woman. David Duchovny, by the way, had a vision of a girl who could play Scully. Actress and former model Jennifer Beals, in his opinion, would perfectly fit into this image. But his choice did not impress the producer. Carter supported Anderson, and she was eventually cast in the role. The prototype of Scully was Clarissa Starling, the character of the 1991 psychological thriller Silence of the Lambs. Red hair, bob cut, strict suits, and seriousness in behavior. These features were also characteristic of Fox's partner. Besides, Dana had a boyfriend in the pilot series. It was planned that she, unlike the obsessed loner Mulder, would lead a completely normal life. Ethan Minette, Scully's boyfriend, lasted only one episode, but the show creators still decided to remove him. The authors allowed the performers of the main roles to participate in the work on the series. As a result, some episodes were completely directed by David Duchovny and one, called All Things, was written and filmed by Anderson herself. The first five seasons were filmed in Vancouver. There are many forests here, which are ideal for filming mysterious places. Later, David Duchovny refused to shoot in Canada, demanding the filming transfer to Los Angeles. The main reason was that the actor did not want to be constantly away from his wife, actress Tia Leone. The relationship between the on-screen couple of FBI agents developed gradually, but in real life, David and Jillian did not immediately get along. At first, there was contempt and rejection. We used to argue about nothing. We couldn't stand the sight of each other. Now the actors are friends and jokingly mention Vancouver and curious incidents during filming. For example, about the fact that the humid Canadian climate always ruins Scully's hair, so the actress had to blow dry it after each filmed scene. Mulder's cynical jokes were usually impromptu by Duchovny himself, who in real life also has a peculiar sense of humor. And there is the big difference in height. Did you know that Anderson is almost 8 inches shorter than David? That is why, when filming the dialogues between the main characters, the cameraman put the actress on a special box, which was nicknamed the Jilly Board. In one of the old interviews, the actress admitted that sometimes during serious scenes, she forgot that she was standing on the box, turned to the camera, and fell. Initially, the producers set conditions for Jillian. In the shot, the actress should usually stand behind David Duchovny. Thus, Agent Mulder was literally coming to the fore. For the first three seasons, the actress was paid half as much as her colleague on the set. Anderson was able to achieve equal pay with David only after having a big Scully's fan base. She spent her first fee for filming The X-Files on a lithograph by the British artist David Blackburn. The actress still collects works of art and is also fond of architecture and interior design. As often happens, the tabloids began to suspect Anderson and Duchovny having an affair, but the actress repeatedly denied these rumors. But uh, we, we are close. We know each other very well now because of um, the intensity of the work and the fact that we work together, you know, 14 hours a day, almost every single day. Mm. And um, so we're, we're close in that respect. Um, um, we don't hang out together on weekends. Mm. I, I spend time with my family and, and he does what he does. But uh... I actually don't know very much about David. 
Anderson said in an interview in 2018. And it's a funny thing. We've spent so much time with each other over the years that I've probably been together with him more than in any other relationship I've had. During the filming of the first season of The X-Files, Jillian met the assistant art director Clyde Klotz. The couple quickly developed an affair. It wasn't quite love at first sight. It was Clyde's smile that first attracted me. He was very quiet, rugged, and cool, but I soon realized he had a lot to say and that he was a very intelligent man. On New Year's Eve, Jillian and Clyde flew to Hawaii and got married on the 17th pole of the golf course. Apart from the newlyweds, there was only a Buddhist monk who conducted the ceremony. The couple decided not to invite their parents. They only sent a letter to Rosemary and Edward with this news. They reacted positively and were not offended that they were not invited to the wedding. Jillian returned to filming the first season of The X-Files two days later. A few months later, she learned that she would soon become a mother. Although the contract with the studio did not prohibit pregnancy, this fact was shocking news for Fox executives. Anderson herself admitted that she didn't fully think in advance about the consequences of this decision. Very well now, because of um, the intensity of the work and the fact that we work together, you know, 14 hours a day, almost every single day. Mm -hmm. And um, so we're, we're close in that respect. Um, um, we don't hang out together on weekends. Mm -hmm. I, I spend time with my family and, and he does what he does. But... Uh, when Jillian found out she was pregnant, the first person she told the news on the phone was not her husband or the director, but her partner in the series, David Duchovny. He was silent for a minute, then said to the woman, Of course, give birth. The TV series is not important. The show creators already wanted to reshoot the material with another actress, but Chris Carter stood up for Jillian again and refused to cast the new Scully. He justified this by the fact that part of the success of the show is the audience's investment in these characters. As a result, the role of Scully was Anderson's, but her husband was fired from the X-Files team. So until the end of the season, the actress was filmed so that her belly was not visible. The crew was um, incredibly supportive. Um, you know, I'd be standing up for a shot and then they'd, they'd run over an apple box, which is a box that I'm normally standing on because of my height. But um, they'd run one over to me for me to sit on to rest my feet and stuff. And they, they were just wonderful. And they brought in a cot and so in between scenes, I'd, I'd sleep on the, on the cot and... And at the beginning of the second season, Chris rewrote the script especially for her. According to the plot, the agent was abducted by aliens, and due to this, Jillian did not appear on screen long enough to have time to give birth and take her 10-day maternity leave. Her daughter, Piper, was born on September 25, 1994. The actress had to undergo an unexpected cesarean section, because of which she spent the next six days in the hospital. Four days later, Jillian returned to the filming of the episode, One Breath. Later. Anderson was telling about this experience. During the first season, I didn't know who the hell I was, let alone who this character was. I feel stronger as a person in the world now. I remember after going through the birthing process feeling that no cut, no abrasions, no knock on the head will make me whine again. A happy mother could no longer imagine her life without Piper, and Chris, thanks to whom Jillian stayed in the series, became her daughter's godfather and named one of the episodes of the show in honor of his goddaughter, Piper Maru. And one more interesting fact about family ties. Jillian's younger sister, Zoe, played 14-year-old Dana Scully in one of the episodes of The X-Files. After the first season, the series gained huge popularity all over the world. At the end of the 90s, when TV viewers were not yet spoiled by a large amount of quality content, The X-Files became a guide to the world of fantastic and incredible for many people. The investigations conducted by Fox Mulder and Dana Scully were fascinating and made you believe that the truth was really out there. The iconic characters even appeared in The Springfield Files, an episode of the popular The Simpsons series. In the plot, agents arrived in Springfield after Homer claimed to have seen an alien in the woods. Anderson and Duchovny voiced their characters there. The showrunners of The X-Files also made a complimentary gesture, and in one of the episodes of the series, the sleeping worker in the nuclear plant was called Homer. And is there a person who does not remember the mysterious whistling melody that sounds at the beginning of each episode? Even those who were not fans of the TV show in the 90s knew it. In fact, the soundtrack was created by the composer after he listened to the song How Soon Is Now by The Smiths, known to many for the TV series Charmed. When the whistle was ready, Snow accidentally touched the reverb control, which resulted in an echo effect. The composer liked the result so much that he decided to keep this version of the melody. 
As a result, the theme turned out to be energizing and inspired thoughts about the supernatural. After the release of the show's first season, club remixes of the X-Files tune broke into the music charts of the UK, France, and Australia, and climbed up there all the way to the second place. The popularity of the series in America has skyrocketed. The record figure was 30 million. That's how many viewers gathered around TV screens at the same time for each episode, only in the United States. Unbelievably, despite the love and undeniable recognition, critics' opinions about The X-Files were initially negative. After the release of the first episodes, Entertainment Weekly published an article calling them a stupid TV show doomed in advance to failure. However, after the overwhelming success of the first season, this tabloid has become one of the most loyal fans of the on-screen FBI agents. And in 2012, the magazine put The X-Files on the fourth place in the list of 25 best cult television shows of the last 25 years. To be fair, it should be noted that not only film critics did not believe in such a breakthrough on television, but also the show creators and its main stars. David Duchovny admitted in an interview that after the first reading of the script, he concluded that such a show would not find many fans, but decided to take a risk by agreeing to participate in it. The series itself lasted for 11 seasons. However, only five of them were initially planned. The creators did not want to drag out the project, fearing that it would become another soap opera. At the end of the fifth season, it became clear that the ratings were too high and it was necessary to continue the work. And do you like this legendary series? If so, tell us about your favorite episode. It will be interesting to hear your opinion. During her time on The X-Files, Anderson won numerous awards for her portrayal of Special Agent Scully, including an Emmy Award and a Golden Globe Award for Best Actress, two Screen Actors Guild Awards, and a Saturn Award. Anderson is the first actress to win an Emmy Award, a Golden Globe Award, and a SAG Award in one year. Besides, Anderson's character in The X-Files started a phenomenon called the Scully Effect. After all, the doctor and FBI agent inspired many young women to pursue careers in science, medicine, and law enforcement. This contributed to the increase in the number of women in these spheres. In 1996, Anderson became the voiceover for the television documentaries Spies Above and Why Planes Go Down. While hosting the BBC documentary series Future Fantastic, she was blown away by the show's musical accompaniment by electronic duo HAL. The star supported the group in the creation of their electronic music album Future, a journey through the electronic underground for Virgin Records, which was praised by European music critics. Anderson also recorded spoken vocals and starred in the music video for Hall's single, Extremis, which was often broadcast on MTV. I was narrating uh, the show in different, I was on my hiatus, and so I was in different parts of, uh, of the world, and, and so I kept on hearing the feedback through my, my headphones while I was doing the narration of, um, of the music that was uh, the soundtrack for the series. And um, I kept saying to the, uh, the producer and director, David McNabb at the time, um, who ended up um, filming, shooting the video, that, uh, that the music was amazing and that I think that they should put together a, a compilation of the music. And it was after the music video release that Gillian was named the sexiest woman in the world in two well-known magazines. The actress herself at that time was going through a divorce with her husband, Clyde Klotz. Despite family troubles, the actress continued to act in movies. In 1997, she appeared in the independent film Chicago Cab with Paul Dillon, John Cusick, and Julianne Moore. The film was about a taxi driver and his passengers. Despite the vividness of the story, the film was criticized for the unrealistic, extraordinary life stories of the main character's fellow travelers. The next year was one of the most eventful years of her career. The X-Files made the jump to the big screen with the summer blockbuster, The X-Files Fight the Future. In the fall of the same year, Gillian played supporting roles in two more films, playing By Heart with Sean Connery and Angelina Jolie, and The Mighty with Sharon Stone. The screen images of those years were far from the already familiar image of Dana Scully. However, this was exactly what the actress was trying to do, not to become a hostage of her role. What I've done so far has been very different. I played kind of a South Side Chicago chick in her early 20s in a movie called Chicago Cab, and then a middle-aged vintage biker alcoholic in a movie called The Mighty. I tend to steer away from those that are similar to Scully at all, and hopefully, we'll pull it off. Being a huge fan of anime, Studio Ghibli and the work of Hayao Miyazaki, Anderson voiced the character Moro in the English-language version of Princess Mononoke. 
Looking ahead, let's say that this will not be her only cooperation with the studio. The following year, Gillian played the main role in Terence Davies' film The House of Mirth, a film adaptation of Edith Wharton's novel of the same name. From the first minutes, the viewer immerses into the atmosphere of the 20th century. Women in chic dresses, men in suit, amazingly chosen shooting locations. All this realistically reflected the features of the past era. Anderson's character, Lily Bart, an attractive woman who took a prominent place in society, faced the reverse side of success. Her beauty and charm caused unhealthy interest and envy. And while Lily looked for a rich man to meet society's expectations, she lost true love. The star later described her character. What fascinates me most about Lily Bart is the journey that she goes on. No matter how many times I read the script, tears came to my eyes. There was just something about it that was so tragic. On the one hand, Lily was a spoiled girl who was used to being supported by her aunt. She was more interested in gambling and flirting with men, and material well-being was more important than mutuality. On the other hand, viewers saw that she was capable of strong feelings. This film was about love and hatred, loyalty and betrayal, true friendship and hypocrisy, wealth and poverty, life and death. The movie was included in the 10 best films of 2000, according to the critics of Rolling Stone. Entertainment Weekly, Film Comment, Newsday, New York Daily News, Village Voice, and New York Press. Gillian received critical acclaim for her role in this drama, British Independent Film Award for Best Actress, and Village Voice Film Poll Best Lead Performance. The crazy shooting schedule left the star with almost no time for her daughter and personal space. A lot of the decisions that I have made and purposely have not made have been as a result of the schedule with my daughter. Anderson said, She's a child of divorce, and there is a schedule. It has actually worked extraordinarily well, but it has been very important for me that my work takes away from my time with her as little as possible. Unfortunately, it is not always possible. Something that you have already committed to gets moved, but it is a good place to start. Always putting time with her first. It has caused some hassle here and there, and it has been something that I have really had to stick my guns with. Therefore, after the end of the then-final season of X-Files in 2002, she moved to London in order to slow down the pace of life a little and get the opportunity to return to the theatre stage. I loved being in London, but what I loved the most, I think, and what I learned from the most was about the moment-to-moment -moment focus that takes place in live theatre. In the West End the same year, Anderson made her debut in Michael Weller's play What the Night is For at the Comedy Theatre. In addition to working on the stage, the star also participated in public initiatives. Gillian supported the South African AIDS cure campaign at a demonstration in London. She advocated for greater access to medicines to reduce the effects of HIV and prevent new diseases. Anderson later became a board member of Artists for a New South Africa and an activist for ACTSA, Action for Southern Africa. The actress also supported the charity fund Discade, aimed to help young black musicians in South Africa. Changes have also taken place in the star's personal life. On December 29, 2004, she got married for the second time. Her spouse was the documentarian Julian Ozan. The wedding took place on the island of Lamu off the coast of Kenya. Only close relatives and a few friends were present at the event. However, even this marriage did not pass the time test. After 16 months, the couple divorced. Despite this, the actress's career grew and every year there were more and more successful roles. Anderson appeared as Lady Deadlock in the BBC adaptation of Charles Dickens' novel Bleak House. For this project, she was nominated for four prestigious awards, including an Emmy and a Golden Globe, and won the Broadcasting Press Guild Television and Radio Award for Best Actress. Perhaps it was the performance in this film that inspired the star to become a patron of the Charles Dickens Statue Fund in 2013 and participate in securing funding for the first Dickens statue in the UK, located in Portsmouth. In the same year, the actress played the main role in the little-known Irish film The Mighty Celt, written and directed by Pierce Elliott. The film was a modern coming-of-age tale set in the world of greyhound racing. Gillian's character became a single mother who was trying to establish a relationship with her former lover, whom she had not seen for 15 years. The actress spoke warmly about the work on this movie, noting, however, that the Irish accent was the most difficult part of the staging process for her. It's hard. Was it? It is, How yeah. Apparently it's one of the hardest, but I don't, um, I haven't, I haven't done that many accents, so, but it's, it's quite, it's, it's, it's very challenging. For the role, Anderson won the IFTA Award for Best International Actress. 
In 2006 and 2007, Anderson starred in two more British films, Straight Heads and The Last King of Scotland. While filming the latter, Anderson founded a charity project that helped Alan Yakiruk School in Kampala, Uganda, and ran it until 2011. At the same time, she was already in a relationship with businessman Mark Griffiths and was carrying their firstborn son, Oscar. The star informed her fans about this joyful news this way. Oh, by the way, I am pregnant, which I have no doubt many of you know from the ridiculous tabloids around the globe, but it so happens to be the one thing out of so much nonsense that is true. And I am very excited, and I am very fat. When her son was born, Anderson said he needed her attention all the time, and he was constantly eating and never seemed to be full. He doesn't cry so much, she said, but when he is upset, he just kind of yells at us. It is really funny. The young mother slept little and was very tired, so she had to say goodbye to her usual crazy work schedule and slow down the filming pace. However, the very next year, Anderson appeared in the continuation of the legendary X-Files, called The X-Files, I Want to Believe. Jillian came to the premiere pregnant with Mark's second child, son Felix. What was it like coming back again after all these years? Um, one thing I still get is, um, is are you a believer? Do you believe in the right. paranormal? What about the baby thing? Is <laughs> I am having an alien baby because my partner's um, British. Despite the fact that it grossed $68.4 million worldwide on a $30 million budget, the film received generally negative reviews. Although critics praised the chemistry between Duchovny and Anderson, they were disappointed by the storyline. Also this year, the star appeared in the British comedy How to Lose Friends and Alienate People, together with Megan Fox, Kirsten Dunst, and Jeff Bridges. The film also received mostly negative reviews. Despite the busy filming schedule, Gillian also did not forget to engage in social activities. She co-founded Sayas, an organization that trains mentors to support and motivate youngsters in South Africa. This non-profit organization provides young people leaving orphanages with counseling that enables them to develop their skills, continue their education, become independent adults, and actively participate in society. However, the actress did not forget to appear on the theater stage. In 2009, in the play A Doll's House by Henrik Ibsen, Jillian portrayed Nora Helmer, the mother of three children who she was in real life. Her character embodied the ideal wife of the 19th century. Anderson, on the other hand, was not married to the father of her sons. For this performance, the star was nominated for the prestigious Laurence Olivier Award for Best Actress. The following years also seemed very busy. During this period, Anderson mostly starred in screen adaptations of novels. So, in 2010, she played Wallace Simpson, the Duchess of Windsor, in the miniseries Any Human Heart. This is the life story of writer Logan Mountstuart, with its ups and downs, triumphs and defeats, successes and failures in the 20th century. Despite mixed reviews from critics regarding the high number of cliches in the storyline, the cast was rated quite highly, and for her, Countess Gillian was nominated for a BAFTA for Best Supporting Actress on Television. The following year, the audience saw her in a supporting role in the novel adaptation of The Crimson Petal and The White and as Elizabeth, Ahab's wife, in the miniseries Moby Dick. Anderson also appeared as Miss Havisham in the BBC's three-part adaptation of Great Expectations, which she received an Artistic Excellence Award. Then the star stopped portraying historical figures for a while and starred in the comedy Johnny English Reborn with the British comedian Rowan Atkinson, known to us as Mr. Bean. By the way, would you like to know more about this actor? Write in the comments and we will definitely consider your wishes. Gillian, who played MI7 Chief Pamela Thornton in the movie, raved about her co-star's performance and admitted that it was very difficult to hold back laughter during filming. He's he's a very technical um, actor and comedian, and uh, and the, just the nature of comedy scenes mm. in in this you know in, in a film like this is very very technical, and so that there's a seriousness around, yeah. and um, and what what becomes interesting is that that everything's very very serious, very very serious talking about this, mm. blah, 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 blah. and then he'll start yeah. his thing, and um, it's so completely the antithesis of the seriousness that has yeah. just taken place, that it is often very hard to, uh, to hide your reaction. However, the actress will no longer want to laugh next year. A tragic event in the Anderson family will make all its members forget about fun for a long time. And all because the actress's younger brother, Aaron, who had been diagnosed with neurofibromatosis three years before, died at the age of 30 from a brain tumor. He used to be a family favorite, and was about to get a degree in developmental psychology from Stanford University. Apart from it, Aaron was a DJ, a mentor, and a Buddhist. 
His death was a great shock for the whole family. Because he was who he was, and he had very strong Buddhist practice, he made it an extraordinary experience for all of us, because he embraced it, so to speak. It was what it was, and he lived the last few years of his life with incredible grace, and it brought us all closer together. Even before her brother's death, Jillian appealed to the U.S. government and Congress to increase funding for research into this disease. She also became an honorary representative of the Neurofibromatosis Association and took an active part in the work of the foundation, holding charity auctions. Anderson also supported the organization Children with Tumors and the Global Genes Movement, which dealt with helping children with neurofibromatosis. Having just come to terms with her brother's loss, Jillian had to let go of another important person in her life. Her six-year relationship with businessman Mark Griffiths also ended. In order to distract herself from sad events, the actress got herself occupied with work. She starred in the Swiss crime drama Sister, the British-Irish film Shadow Dancer, the Canadian techno-thriller I'll Follow You Down, and the melodrama Mr. Morgan's Last Love with Michael Caine. Anderson also voiced the character of the Dr. Miki Hokoto in the English version of the Studio Ghibli anime from Up on Poppy Hill which was released in March 2013. That same year, Anderson began starring in the BBC psychological thriller The Fall about the lives of two hunters, a serial killer hunting victims in and around Belfast and a female detective hunting him. I play a character called Stella Gibson. The local investigative officers are having trouble finding any clues, catching anybody, narrowing down who the killer is, and so she's been brought in to do a review of the investigation. I've done 28 day reviews before, sir. Not to hear you haven't. Things are different here. That's how it begins. And then she ends up staying longer because it's determined that the case is actually more complicated and may involve a serial killer. Jamie Dornan, who became her partner on the set and the main antagonist in the movie. Unlike usual thrillers, the main intrigue of which is who is the killer, in the fall, the audience is introduced to the anti-hero right away. The series focuses on another question. Why does someone who can be considered a normal person with a job, wife, and children kill? Stella Gibson is Anderson's most beloved character, even more than Scully from The X-Files. She is enigmatic, cold, intelligent, professional, strong, all of those things. There is vulnerability there and a sensitivity that comes out in fits and spurts. When her raw patches are touched, she is not infallible, but at the same time, she is slightly scary. For her role as a cold, self-confident female detective, Anderson received critical acclaim and was nominated for several awards. The series lasted only three seasons, but it became very successful and popular. The Guardian named it the 10th best TV show of 2013. Not straying far from her roles as Scully and Gibson, Anderson played Dr. Bedelia du Maurier, Hannibal Lecter's psychiatrist, on NBC's Hannibal from 2013 to 2015. Though in the first two seasons, the star did not appear in all episodes, and the third one, her character became one of the most significant in the series. The star also appeared in Jeffrey D. Brown's social drama Sold, where she played Sophia, a character based on a real person, photographer Lisa Christine. The film dealt with the issues of child trafficking and sexual slavery in India and was based on Patricia McCormick's novel. The film won five awards and was well received by critics. Sold is a much-watched film which raises a clarion call for action. If it saves girls from being sold into sexual slavery, it will go down in the annals of cinematic history as a film which made a mighty difference. At the same time, Anderson was not leaving the theater stage. She received critical acclaim for her performance as Blanche de Bois in Tennessee Williams' A Streetcar Named Desire at the Young Vic Theatre in London. The star had dreamt of this role since she was two, and finally her dream came true. The production became the fastest-selling show in the theatre's history, and the run was extended for two weeks due to demand for tickets. As part of the first collaboration between the Young Vic Theatre and National Theatre Live, on the 16th of September 2014, the show was broadcast live to over 1,100 venues. It was bloody intense, a three and a half hour play. For however many performances we did a week, I got injured. However, the cut on her leg was only a small inconvenience before the real recognition of her talent. Jillian won the Evening Standard Theater Award for Best Actress and her second Laurence Olivier Award nomination. In February 2015, Anderson became the director and starred in the prequel of A Streetcar Named Desire, short film called The Departure. 
written by novelist Andrew O'Hagan. I, I would find it near to impossible to direct myself in something where I didn't already know the character very well. Um, and I don't think I'd want to attempt it. The benefit of this and having done Blanche and Streetcar and I could just you know, show up and do it and then focus on where I needed to be in the room for the sake of the shot as much as for the sake of the scene itself. The actress also noted that the film felt like an interesting character study in a certain time period and that it was designed to maintain a theatrical feel and capture an element of magical realism that was present in Williams' work. Critics noted a very peculiar, rather specific directorial and cameraman approach. With the help of light and space, the film clearly shows hopelessness, longing, despair, and the monotony of the main character's life. It was also noted that this short film, despite the lack of dynamics, scenes, and plan changes, could tell a lot, and the gaze would be glued to the screen for all 17 minutes, captivating the attention until the last moment. The star's busy work schedule did not prevent her from trying herself in writing. In October 2014, Anderson published her first book, A Vision of Fire, co-authored with Jeff Roven. This book is the first novel in the Earth End Saga trilogy. It can be described as a science fiction thriller of epic proportions. In the center of the plot is child psychologist Caitlin O'Hara, who investigates the strange behavior of teenagers. As these cases spread around the world, Caitlin begins to think that it has something to do with the supernatural. She does everything she can to uncover the unexplainable connections between these seemingly unrelated cases to not only save her patient, Manique, but also the entire world from disaster. The plot of the book is really fascinating and deserves a screen adaptation. The author has repeatedly admitted that she also thought about it while writing the novel. To me, in stepping into this, that it was something that I was actively creating for a potential um, film, specifically film project. Um, that was my in uh, for it, and and in creating a character that I would then play, but also creating um, scenes that were um, filmic enough to. I guess, compete with the other things that one sees uh, um, in cinemas today. Um, and so the trajectory of the trilogy um, became, with that in mind, quite uh, massive. The very next year, Rovan and Anderson published their second novel, A Dream of Ice, and a year later, the last part of the trilogy, A Sound of Seas. Soon, Anderson returned to her usual role of Dana Scully and played her in six episodes of the 10th season of The X-Files. The actress again received the same fee as her co-star, David Duchovny. As she always spoke openly about her struggle for equal pay for men and women, this time she also managed to defend her own rights. Also that year, not portraying her active public position, Anderson, together with journalist Jennifer Nadal, published a self-help guide for women called We, a manifesto for women everywhere. The book is a call-out to all women around the world, and by women I include girls, transgender, anyone who identifies themselves as being intrinsically female. She wanted women to feel that they were not alone. Getting honest is really important. I think, had I not found tools to help me out of that pain, or to show me that there were people out there who were on a similar journey, the combination of those two things most certainly have contributed to me still being on the planet. Jillian said. The actress is a supporter of various women's organizations and social movements, such as the Feminist Majority Foundation and V-Day, which aims to end violence against females. She has also attended events aimed at ending gender apartheid in Afghanistan and has been a passionate supporter of Afghan women's rights. She also supported the Refuge Charity, which provides specialized support to women and children who have experienced domestic violence. At this time, a new man appeared in Jillian's personal life. This time, it was a British screenwriter and playwright, Peter Morgan, six years older than his girlfriend. As Page Six reported, the couple had met on the set of the TV series Sexual Education. Since then, they had been one of those progressive couples who lived in separate houses, as Anderson said in an interview with the Sunday Times. My partner and I don't live together. If we did, that would be the end of us. It works so well as it is, and it feels so special when we do come together. As the actress and the screenwriter raised their own children, by the way, Peter has five. They decided not to mix romantic relationships with taking care of their kids. At the same time, Anderson's career did not stop for a moment. She played the goddess Media in the first season of American Gods, an adaptation of Neil Gaiman's science fiction novel. The role was small, but still remarkable. Lucy Ricardo. I'm all sword, Shadow. The screen's the altar. 
I'm the one they sacrificed to. Then till now, golden age to golden age. They sit side by side, ignore each other, and give it up to me. Now they hold a smaller screen in their lap or in the palm of their hands so they don't get bored watching the big one. Time and attention. Better than lamb's blood. Also, the actress appeared in the movie Crooked House, the adaptation of Agatha Christie's book, where she shared the set with Glenn Close and Christina Hendricks. In January 2018, she again played Special Agent Scully in the 11th and final season of The X-Files. And if the previous season had everyone wondering what was that, the final one, on the contrary, showed everything the audience once loved about Mulder and Scully's adventures. In the new season, the variety of genres pleased both critics and ordinary viewers. There were cyberpunk, a mystical thriller like Supernatural, a bloody horror about maniacs, and even a dystopia and an ironic revolt of machines statement like in Black Mirror series. The quirky sense of humor, bright characters, and unexpected ending were what made season 11 a hit on Netflix. Even Anderson was pleasantly surprised by the number of the X-Files fans. We know that the fans are still there. The surprising thing was that there are new fans, the star said. There's a whole other generation of fans who discovered it through Netflix, and I think to be met still by 13-year-olds who were talking about how they have seen all the episodes, or they just started watching a year ago and they obsess and they can't wait for the new season. The show has a longevity beyond what we had ever imagined. Despite the good reviews from critics and the fans' excitement, Jillian still confirmed that she will not return to her famous character, Dana Scully. I think this will be it for me, Anderson told reporters. Of course, one can always hope that she will change her mind. However, for her vivid role as an FBI agent, the actress received a star on the Walk of Fame in Hollywood, and it was in the same year that the last season of The X-Files was released. In her speech, Anderson credited her big break more to luck than ambition. I was so green at the beginning and so young, I was just exploring, she said. I showed up and hit my mark and learned my lines, and was pulled into this vortex of this hit show. It was my first professional proper gig, and it was a canon of sorts. Jillian also noted that she would always be very grateful to Scully for the impact she had on both her own career and a number of young women around the world, many of whom decided to have a career in science or law enforcement after watching the show. It is interesting that before receiving her own star, the actress was not very positive about the concept of the Walk of Fame. She thought it looked more like a cemetery, and when her partner in the series David Duchovny received his star there two years earlier, she did not come to support him at the ceremony. Instead, she wrote on Twitter, Congrats at David Duchovny. I'll be right beside you when I die too. She seemed to know something. After all, later her star was located next to his. David also could not keep silent and posted a photo on Instagram of a smiling Anderson on the Walk of Fame, writing, You said you'd be right next to me when you died too. You were right. But this isn't death. It's a beginning. So much more for you. I hope that some kind soul builds a jilly ramp from your square to mine. Friends, partners, and now neighbors. Congratulations at Jillian A. Love, David. By the way, if you want to learn more about other celebrities who are lucky owners of stars on the Walk of Fame, do not forget to subscribe to our channel. Here we talk about the best of the best. And click on the bell to receive notifications about the release of new stories. 2019 was a significant year for Anderson in the final change of usual roles. After all, the controversial youth series Sex Education was released on the Netflix streaming platform. This British comedy drama, created by Laurie Nunn, follows the lives of the students, staff, and parents of the fictional Moraldale High School. The plot mainly focuses on Otis, played by Aza Butterfield, the teenage son of famous sex therapist, played by Gillian Anderson, who talks openly about all aspects of sexuality, often embarrassing her son. However, in the future, this mother's approach turns out to be useful because Otis, together with his friend Maeve, establishes a sexual counseling clinic at school. A wide range of topics important to young people, from the attitude to their bodies to abortion and homophobia, which are covered in the show, became a real hit among viewers. However, Anderson was not in a hurry to become a part of this show at first. At the first reading of the script, she did not like its plot at all. When I first got the script, I threw it in the bin, which is true. I read some of it and I thought, this is too broad for me and then my boyfriend who's a writer read it and said you can't you have to do this it's so funny just read it again read it again read it again um and i did and i couldn't put it down maybe i was in a bad mood <laughs> 
To better prepare for her role, Gillian read Nancy Friday's book, My Secret Garden, which was published during the so-called sexual revolution of the 1960s and 1970s, and became a hit. Although Gillian did not appear so often in the first season, she definitely became the star of the series in the second one. In an interview with Vogue, the actress shared her thoughts about her character. She noted that what she liked about Jean was that she was quite shameless when it came to being intimate unless she was actually having something with a potential partner. She was boundless, unrestrained and inappropriate, but at the same time full of contradictions. There were a lot of things in Jean's house that looked a lot like genitalia. Therefore, the actress took many photos and posted them on her Instagram with the hashtags hashtag Yoni of the day and hashtag penis of the day. Her social networks assistant warned the star that she could be banned for this. No one was sure that such controversial posts would not harm Anderson's career. She even blocked her younger children on her page so that they would not see what their mother was posting. However, contrary to expectations, fans liked the idea so much that people started sending her in DMs everything that could be signed with Jillian's hashtags. Plants, buildings, food. In the second season, Jean starts working at Otis's school and talking to her son's classmates about sex. And this becomes a real test for him. Anderson was very worried about whether such a change would suit her character. After all, everyone is used to seeing her as strange, funny, and sexy. But in the end, everything turned out very organically. Jean is just a person who shows the full range of human weaknesses, and that's great. She's not perfect, and the audience sympathizes with that. I felt like even though my character obviously is very open, sometimes too open, incredibly liberal and sexually free, and I feel like there's nothing that usually shocks me, but there were moments where I thought, can we say that, really? God bless Netflix. However, such frankness of the series often deferred from the actress's personal principles. That is why, when the first season of Sex Education was released, Anderson forbade her children to watch it. And although she is sure that they have not listened to her, she lives happily in denial, pretending that this is not the case. This comedy drama became a breath of fresh air for the audience because the topics raised in it were considered shameful and taboo for a long time. Jillian also noted that everything covered in the series was a part of our everyday life, but people pretended that it didn't exist. Why? Perhaps because they awaken too many feelings or reveal too many aspects of ourselves. However, it was this extraordinary approach to forbidden topics that became the highlight of the show. I think a show like this is, is, is extraordinarily helpful in different countries, in different cultures, in different neighborhoods even in different religions and different um, emotional relationships. One of the extraordinary things that the show does is it, it shows that whoever you are and whatever your, your feelings or thoughts or proclivities or tastes or sexual preference, whoever you claim you are and what feels comfortable is okay. So the fact that there's a place where there is such diverse representation that, uh, you know, and that there is, even though there is conflict and there is pain and there is fear and there is lack of communication, that somehow that's part of the story, that it basically deals with everything. It is still worth noting that many intimate scenes in the series could not but shock the average viewer, and the actors themselves were not always comfortable acting in them. For this purpose, intimacy specialists were invited to the set. Special latex suits were used in nude scenes, and props replaced intimate parts of the body with believable artificial ones. Sex Education received critical acclaim for its cast, script, direction, performance, and mature enlightenment of topics. The show was also a success with viewers. Over 40 million watched the first season after its debut. Jillian did not stop playing a sex therapist in a teenage drama, and in the same year appeared on TV screens in an opposite but also very remarkable role. This time, former British Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher in the fourth season of Netflix's historical drama series The Crown. By the way, Anderson is the second American actress after Meryl Streep to play Thatcher in a major production. Gillian prepared in advance for the role of the Iron Lady. Many fans have been impressed by how similar the screened Thatcher Anderson is compared to the real one from the video chronicles. It's a miracle of acting transformation. However, Anderson does not hide a large part of this miracle. She had to wear a wig and a special jumpsuit imitating Thatcher's figure. The jumpsuit not only thickens, it repeats the shape of the stomach, breasts, and hips of the legendary Prime Minister. It was certainly not easy to walk in such a thing. Makeup artists also had to work on Anderson's face. The fact is that the series creators were confused by how much younger Jillian looks than her character, although the age difference between women is only five years. Of course, there was the question of changing the jaw shape for more similarity. However, the actress rejected the idea of silicone overlays because it was more important for her to preserve natural facial expressions. Well, certainly the voice is a big uh, way in 
to her and um you know you can do everything that you you want physically in terms of you know adding a wig and adding clothes and a um you know a, a suit i wore a suit to make me a bit wider anderson learned to copy the speaking manner with a slight breath so that the copy did not turn into a parody she had a very very high voice and I had to make some decisions early on not to turn away too many audience members with too high of an interpretation of what she was doing and find some kind of middle ground with it, said Anderson. To become Thatcher, she also had to learn her walk, as it was very specific. Transformation into the Iron Lady was not the only difficulty for Jillian in working on The Crown. After all, during the shooting, she had to cooperate with her boyfriend. For many couples, such cooperation did not end well. But Anderson and Morgan, the showrunner of The Crown, found a solution. The lovers agreed that Jillian would not say anything about the script and Peter would not comment on Jillian's performance. Such mutual agreements should probably be adopted by many couples who work together, even at home. Despite all the difficulties in the filming process, the star repeatedly said that she was happy to be able to join the cast and crew of The Crown and to have the opportunity to play the role of such a complex and controversial woman. Of course, the audience couldn't help but have a question. To what extent does she agree with Thatcher and does she share her beliefs? Jillian replied that as an actress, she had to get to a point where her own opinion on the subject didn't matter. There were only the motives of the character. As a mother, as a political figure, Anderson is generally as cautious as possible in her assessments of Thatcher's actions. It's a blessing to play such a complex and contradictory character. She was, of course, a formidable woman, but I wanted to show other sides of her as well. After I got acquainted with her biography, got used to the image, I sincerely fell in love with her. You can treat her differently, but you can't help but admit that she created an entire era. Critics were delighted with this image of Iron Lady. So, according to the reviewer of The Independent, the actress managed to present her not as a historical character, but as a real person. And in The Washington Post, it was about the accuracy of conveying the image of the conservative prime minister, and it was also noted that Anderson played Thatcher better than Meryl Streep, who received an Oscar for The Iron Lady in 2011. For portraying her character, Anderson won Emmy and Golden Globe Awards. After the awards ceremony, the actress was presented with a huge phallic-shaped chocolate cake with the inscription, congrats on a big one. This is a cake, but, yes. But you guys can't really see how big it was. <laughs> it was half my height. <laughs> was uh -huh. it really? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. I, I, I should have taken a picture of uh, first perspective with me next to it, but it was huge. In November 2021, Anderson voiced the cat in the Christmas short animation Robin Robin about a bird raised by mice. It dared to steal a shining star and prove to her family and evil cat that it could be a really good mouse. Robin Robin was nominated for an Academy Award for Best Animated Short Film. In the same year, Anderson played Joanna, the mother of Catherine the Great, in the second season of the series The Great. The actress also portrayed another historical personality in the series. The First Lady, on the streaming service Showtime, the series chronicles the lives and family events of three First Ladies of the United States. Eleanor Roosevelt, played by Anderson, Betty Ford, portrayed by Michelle Pfeiffer, and Michelle Obama, by Viola Davis. Interestingly, there is a scene in one of the first seasons of The X-Files where Mulder asks Scully what historical figure she would like to be if she could choose. Dana, without thinking for a long time, answered, Eleanor Roosevelt. Jillian hesitated whether she could truthfully portray the First Lady. You know, when they first offered me the job, I was like, what? <laughs> I'm like, you know, yeah. I'm short. I'm five foot three. Oh, that's not. She's six foot tall. Yeah. Oh, she was six yeah. foot tall. And even when we were shooting, even though I wore as high as shoes that I could get away with, I was still shorter than anybody else on the show. <laughs> but we decided to ignore that. You decided to ignore I, I assumed that since they were hiring me and after I told them, I was like, look, you guys, you got, are you sure? I was figuring they'd have ramps built and stuff. Despite the star cast and team of professionals who worked on the show, the series received mixed reviews. Audiences praised Pfeiffer and Anderson's performance, as well as the costumes and set design, but criticized the pacing, plot, and Davis's performance. In August 2022, the series was canceled after the first season. In the same year, the American mystical thriller called The Pale Blue Eye was released. This time, Christian Bale became Anderson's partner on the set. However, reviews from critics were mixed again. Also, the actress received the Variety Icon Award for Outstanding Achievements in Acting. Jillian really deserved it because her performance had always delighted both critics and fans in films, on television, and on stage. What I can say is that I have certainly played a lot of iconic women in my now very long career, and women who have punched through barriers and decades to stand above the rest 
in our minds and in our hearts. Dana Scully, Miss Havisham, Margaret Channing, Blanche Dubois, Marilyn Monroe, Lucille Ball, Margaret Thatcher, Eleanor Roosevelt, and David Bowie. I'm very honored. What does our star do now? Jillian launched her first audio show called What Do I Know? The bi-weekly psychological podcast explores deeply human stories about social issues, sexual freedom, and phenomenal people. Besides, the star announced her project called Dear Jillian, where she asked women to write her letters about sexual fantasies and stories, which she will turn into a book. Perhaps it has been the role in sex education that inspired her to implement this idea. On her Instagram, Anderson wrote, Our deepest, most intimate fears and fantasies remain locked away inside of us until someone comes along with the key. Well, here is your key. She urged her admirers to be open in their letters, regardless of age and sexual preferences. Jillian's book plans to reveal what women really think about intimate life, because sex is about womanhood and motherhood, infidelity and exploitation, consent and respect, fairness and egalitarianism, love and hate, pleasure and pain. Since the release of Sex Education, the star has been often asked about whether women trust her with their sexual secrets and problems. Well, they don't, she said, which ultimately is what gave me the idea for a book, a My Secret Garden for the 21st Century, so to speak, that would be revelatory and profound and inclusive across the board. As you can see, the life of our today's star is boiling. She never gives up, tries new roles, engages in social activities. She brings up her three children and gives joy and positivity to everyone who talks to her. Anderson is fun and quirky, controversial and enigmatic. However, she never forgets her roots and the people who helped her on the way to worldwide recognition. By the way, don't forget that our channel has a lot of inspiring stories about famous personalities in the film and music industry. You can find little-known facts from their lives, interesting incidents from the movie sets, and much more by clicking on the video that appeared on your screen. We hope that we've answered all the questions that you might be interested in. We will be grateful if you like this video. It was Biographer. See you soon.